Hey everyone, and welcome to the Hemp Horticulture Series. Today, we'll be going over the abiotic and biotic problems of water, temperature, bugs, mold, and mildew, as well as how to solve them. Is your plant limp, missing chunks of leaves, on fire? If it's actually on fire, your plant's probably dead. But for everything else, you've come to the right place then. Because today, we'll be going over part two of the two-part series to diagnose and fix your plant issues for those working with soil. For part two, we'll be covering the abiotic issues of the plant's environment, from water and moisture to airflow and temperature, as well as going over how they correlate with the biotic issues of bugs, mold, root rot, and mildew. As we've discussed in part one, abiotic means that there's a problem with your plant from non-living factors. Nutrient and environmental issues all fall under this category. Biotic means that there's a problem with your plant from living organisms. Insects, animals, mold, and mildew all fall in this category. So the idea of a perfect grow environment is to have the plant's environment that's adjustable, so we have water, humidity, airflow, and temperature, to be as hospitable as possible for the plant, but at the same time to make it as hostile as possible for biotic factors that could harm the plant, mainly bugs, mold, and mildew. As for bugs, there will always be an overlap because most tend to thrive in the same environment as plants which is why preventative bug control measures are important. But with proper environmental management, mold, mildew, and root rot can be prevented. Of course, keeping a perfect environment is not always possible, and especially for new growers, it's easy to make mistakes. So we'll be going over how to correct these. Let's start first with the easiest, watering. While underwatering is easy to solve, overwatering is much harder to deal with. However, diagnosing over or underwatering is harder than it sounds because the problem is that both under and overwatering share the characteristics of droopy limp leaves. The difference though is that while the leaves of an underwatered plant will look dry, brittle, lifeless, and hang straight down, the leaves of an overwatered plant will be full of water, firm to the touch, and do more of a curve downwards. The easiest way though to differentiate the two is to check the soil one to two inches down when the leaves look limp. If the soil in the middle of the pot is wet, then it's due to overwatering. If it's completely dry, then the plant's underwatered. The fix for an underwater plant is to just water it. However, the fix for an overwatered plant will depend on a number of factors. Ideally, if you're using a fabric pot with lots of perlite, then you can most likely just wait it out until the excess water has evaporated through the pot before watering again. However, if you're using a solid pot or dense soil, waiting it out might take too long. So a couple of things to do first is to check the drainage holes. A lot of solid pots will have very few or only one drainage hole. And if it gets clogged, then there's no way for excess water to get out. So be sure to clear it. And for plastic pots, you can also drill extra holes if needed. Otherwise, you can take a stick and poke some holes into the top of the soil to help with aeration. Just be careful not to damage the roots. And if you're able to, increase the temperature and lower the humidity to help the water evaporate quicker and then return it to normal once the soil is dry. Drying the soil fast is so important because not only is the plant trying to recover from drowning, but this also creates the perfect environment now for certain bugs to nest, as well as root rot. I'll cover bugs soon, but as for root rot, this is a disease that thrives on prolonged low oxygen environments and can slow down the growth or completely destroy the plant if given enough time to spread. So if your plant doesn't look like it's recovering from overwatering, even after the soil is completely dry, this is probably why. If possible, an easy way to check is to take a look at the roots to see if it's brown, slimy, or shriveled. 
Due to the seriousness of this disease, there's a chance that the plant will not survive even with treatment, but there are two common ways to try and save the plant. One is to soak the soil with 3% hydrogen peroxide. While this sounds like it'll do more harm than good to soak the soil again, hydrogen peroxide will do two things to help save the plant. It'll kill off the fungus that could be causing the root rot, and when the hydrogen peroxide breaks down, it actually gets more oxygen into the soil. Just be sure to wait for the hydrogen peroxide to completely dry down to the top two to three inches of soil before watering again. Also note that this will kill off basically everything in the soil, good and bad. And if you're working with organic soil, it will pretty much destroy all the beneficial microbes feeding the plant. So only do this as a last resort. The second method is to take the plant out of the pot, rinse off all the soil so only the roots are left, cut off the parts of the roots that are brown, and then immediately replant the plant with new soil. This is a pretty advanced technique, so I'd only recommend this for people with any type of growing experience. But if your plant's gonna die anyways, what have you got to lose? Now, onto temperature problems, you basically have too hot and too cold. For the too hot problems, there's actually two separate issues because of how indoor grow systems work. Overall heat issues and spot heating issues caused by grow lights. If the temperature overall is over 90 to 100 degrees, your entire plant could start to wilt and will need to either be moved to a cooler location under the shade, if outdoors, or will need a cooling solution like an air conditioning unit or better ventilation if indoors. If only the top leaves look like they're burning up and curling upwards, then that's a spot heating issue caused by the grow light being too close to the plant and just needs a simple fix of moving the light further from the plant. When hemp is too cold, the plant will slow down significantly in growth because the plant's metabolism will slow down in colder weather, as well as causing the plant to perspire less, leading to the plant taking in less water and nutrients. This can be fixed outdoors with a greenhouse or any form of enclosure that could help trap the warm air, and also repotting the plant in something with more insulation to the roots, like a clay pot, will help as well. If the plant is indoors, then a space heater would work well to warm up your grow space. Now, hand in hand with temperature is humidity, which is usually overlooked for a number of reasons. You can't typically gauge humidity the same way you can easily gauge temperature just by feel unless the weather is already near an extreme. And since a plant generally can still grow in a wide range of humidity scenarios from 20 to 80 percent, although 40 to 70 percent is the ideal zone, you'll almost never be in an environment that the plant shows any symptoms due to humidity extremes without an accompanied temperature extreme that affects the plant even more. A uh, high humidity will cause the plant to perspire less, which leads to less water and nutrient intake, slowing the overall plant growth. A low humidity will surprisingly do the same as the pores of the leaves will close up to try and conserve water, leading to no perspiration in the plant, which also slows down overall plant growth. So if your plant happens to be in an extreme high or low humidity situation, a humidifier or a dehumidifier is all you need for indoor grows. However, for outdoor grows, this gets a little tricky as you'll need to enclose the plant first before a humidifier or a dehumidifier could work. But in terms of abiotic issues, humidity is not a big factor when it comes to the health of the plant. However, the bigger issue with humidity extremes is that along with stagnant air, they can lead to the perfect breeding ground for mold and mildew. But let's take a quick look at airflow first. This is pretty simple and straightforward. All plants need is a constant fresh air supply to survive. But the need for constant wind is technically not required. However, due to the multiple benefits of having a good breeze blowing on the plants, it's a necessity for any grow due to the many biotic problems it prevents as well as strengthening the stems. 
A strong wind will prevent a number of bugs, mold, and mildew from being able to have the time on the plant to settle down. And while there is such a thing as too much wind, which can cause damage to the leaves, making them claw downwards, all you need to do if this happens is just tone it back a little. So what happens when you couple high humidity with low air movement? Mold and mildew. These funguses need some time on the plant to settle down and then a water source to multiply. So without a constant wind, fungal spores can have time to establish on the plant and then coupled with high humidity or water trapped in your plant due to dense buds or foliage, they'll have the perfect breeding ground to spread. Now for the two most common types, we have white powdery mildew and bud rot. White powdery mildew is pretty easy to identify as it looks like white or yellow flower looking patches on your plant that rubs off easily. While it usually shows up first on leaves, it can migrate fast to the stems and buds. So if you notice this, you'll need to first wipe off the affected areas with a damp paper towel to remove any visible mildew, then spray down the entire plant with SM90. SM90 is made from plant oils and inhibits common fungal and bacterial pathogens. And although it can be sprayed on buds safely, so it can be used up to the day of harvest, it will leave a lingering citrusy smell. So you'll want to avoid spraying the buds if it hasn't spread. Be sure to also try and change the plant's environment to prevent white powdery mildew from coming back by lowering the humidity, increasing the airflow, and making sure that the foliage of the plant is not too dense. For bud rot, this mold can be a lot harder to detect because it likes to thrive in dense buds that's hard to see until it's too late. If found early, it'll look white and fluffy, but typically by the time it's discovered, it's due to parts of the bud dying and turning brown and gray, falling apart to the touch. There is no cure for bud rot. If discovered, you'll need to remove any parts of the plant that's already affected and then choose to either harvest the rest of the plant before it has time to spread or change the plant's environment in your grow space by adding more air circulation, lowering the humidity, and removing extra foliage to minimize the chance of the mold from spreading to the rest of the plant and hope that it doesn't. And now for bugs. The reason you see an increase of them at the peak grow times of the spring and summer is because bugs are cold blooded, so they tend to only come out when it's warm outside. Yet they also need a water source to survive, which is why an overwatered plant under a nice cozy grow light or greenhouse is the perfect breeding ground for bugs. While you can't lower the temperature without slowing the growth of the plant, you can prevent overwatering a plant, so certain bugs won't be able to live and breathe in the wet soil. And since most pests and bugs have a similar method of operating, as well as being susceptible to the same groups of pest controls, we'll be grouping them together by their similarities. Of course, this is not a comprehensive list, since that would take forever to go over all the harmful bugs. We'll be covering the most common ones, as well as generally how to remove and set up preventative measures to deter just about any bug from thriving in your grow space. Starting with the really tiny ones, we have the bugs that like to eat the cells of leaves. Spider mites, aphids, thrips, and white flies all fall in this category. So if you notice tiny white specks on your leaves, little white dots moving around the underside of your leaves, and small tiny flies flying around, then you most likely have one of these. While all of these can destroy a plant if left to colonize, the scariest of the bunch are spider mites because on top of damaging the plant, they'll also cover everything with webbing, destroying your harvest even after you've managed to get rid of them. The other ones as adults can grow wings, which allow them to migrate from plant to plant. So you definitely want to stop all of these types of bugs as soon as possible. The options now are completely dependent on your plant's stage of growth, since some of these products can affect the taste of your buds. So you don't want to spray the entire plant down once your plant's in the flowering stage. 
starting with things you can't use on buds, we have insecticidal soaps as well as neem oil. Both are great organic options, although with neem oil, because it is oil-based, it'll leave an oily residue on the leaves, which in hot temperatures could burn the leaves. You can try to prevent this by spraying only when the lights are off or when the sun is down. However, if you don't want to deal with an oily residue, there is another organic option similar to neem oil called Azomax that's derived from neem tree seeds but doesn't have the oily residue of neem oil. For the product that's safe to use on buds, Spinosad insecticides, which is an organic chemical safe to consume but affects the nervous system of insects, can be used throughout the entire life cycle of the plant as it doesn't affect the taste or adds harshness to the buds. Of course, if you plan on washing your plant post-harvest, the insecticidal soaps and Azimax are also both fine on buds until harvest. This won't work with neem oil though, since neither hydrogen peroxide, lemon juice, or baking soda will remove oils from the plant. Now if you have little white dots crawling in your soil and tiny black buds flying around but no visible damage on your leaves, then you probably have fungus gnats. These little buggers, while not as detrimental as the previous microscopic buds we just covered, love wet soil and will lay their eggs in it to feed on the roots of your plants. A few here and there isn't very noticeable, but a full infestation could stunt the growth of your plant. Since these bugs multiply in wet soil, the first step to remove them is to keep the top soil dry. Either water in less intervals, add a top layer of dry material to the plant like perlite, or better yet, do both. A treatment of neem oil or SM90 on the top layer of your soil will also help, as neither will affect the plant negatively when used in soil. As for adults, if growing outdoors, just let them fly away. They don't eat the plants, so they'll fly off on their own looking for a new water source and nectar. If your grow space is indoors though, you'll need to set up sticky traps as spraying the plant with any sort of pest control won't do much since they don't feed on the plant. And now onto slightly larger insects, mealybugs and scales. Both of these like to suck the sap out of plants and can be found feeding not only on the leaves but on the stems as well. Since both are visible to the eye without magnification, you can first try to pick, wipe, or spray off any you see with water, and then use either neem oil, Azimax, insecticidal soaps, spina sap, or better yet, a combination of these to get rid of the rest, as they all work. Moving on to the big bugs, we can start first with the jumpers. Crickets, grasshoppers, locusts, and leafhoppers. While the first three will straight up eat chunks of leaves at a time, leaf hoppers suck out the sap of leaves, leaving clusters of brown dots. Either way, these are all easily identifiable due to their size, and if you can shoo them away from your grow space, that's the easiest way to get rid of them. Otherwise, you guessed it, neem oil, azimax, insecticidal soap, spinosad, or a combination of these will get rid of them. And finally, we have the crawlers slugs, snails, and worst of all, caterpillars. Other than green caterpillars which can easily blend in, these should be pretty simple to spot and have the same eating habits, chewing through chunks of leaves at a time and worst, holes in the buds. Slugs and snails are easier to deal with because they need to crawl to the plant and are pretty noticeable. So an easy fix is to remove them from your plant and then tape a layer of copper foil tape around your pots. Slugs and snails get an electric shock when touching copper, so it creates a natural barrier for them. For caterpillars, you'll need to use Spinosad or Bt. Bt is an organic bacterial-based insecticide that prevents the caterpillars from eating and is safe to be sprayed on buds. As you can figure out by now, while each of the individual organic pest controls can't solve all of your problems, there's a big overlap of what bugs they can handle. And because of that, you can rotate between Spinosad, Neem Oil, or Azure Max, and uh, Insecticidal Soap every week or every other week, which should prevent any harmful bugs from making your plant its new home when growing outdoors. Also remember that not all bugs are bad for your plant. 
In fact, there are a large number of beneficial bugs that will actually protect your garden from the plant eating bugs we just covered. The two most beneficial bugs you can have in your garden are ladybugs and lacewings, while one is much cuter than the other. Both will eat up all the smaller bugs and are the most natural way you can control a bug infestation. Both of these are sold live by the hundreds at most gardening stores as well as online. However, they're not a permanent solution. If there's no detrimental pests in your grow space or once the pest infestation is over, the bugs will leave your grow area and search for more food. Spiders will also serve this purpose and will get rid of flying bugs as well. However, you definitely don't want too many of these hanging around unless you like running into webs all the time. And that's it.